Welcome to Season 3 of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. She's a longtime Washington State Senator with her name on too many bills to mention. <laughs> Senator Karen Kaiser represents Washington's 33rd Legislative District, which includes Seattle and Kent. She has championed working families, improving economic security for women, worked on reforming Washington's health care system, helped pass family and medical leave, and so much more. A former broadcast journalist, Senator Kaiser, saw an opportunity to help future lawmakers navigate the ugly world of politics to succeed and make a difference once they reach office. Her book, Getting Elected, is the easy part, working and winning in the state legislature, is the playbook needed to thrive in politics at any level especially for women and BIPOC individuals. Please welcome a very happy Senator Karen Kaiser, who is likely still gleaming from Monday's Sugar Bowl win by the Washington State Huskies. <laughs> that is correct. Absolutely. And looking forward to the national championship. Yes. Coming up. Yes. <laughs> So what made you decide to leave broadcasting to get into politics? Well, I have to say, I was thinking I could do that. I just thought to myself when the opening occurred in my district, I said, well, I could do that because I had covered the legislature as a reporter. I had been around politics since I was a kid and my grandpa would watch me to meet the press every Sunday morning and we'd talk about it at Sunday dinner. And so I thought that would work and I should have thought a little deeper, but I went ahead and threw my hat in the ring and lo and behold, I got appointed to a temporary position and then had to run for election. And, um, and then it hit me. I remember going out in the, about midnight on the driveway and hitting my head and saying, what was I thinking? Because I had never run for election and it was a complete um, overwhelming chore I was very, very lucky to have um, supporters help me because I couldn't have done it myself. Back then, we didn't have the sophisticated systems of political consultants and campaign committees to help people. You were pretty much on your own. So luckily, women's groups, labor groups helped me organize and raise money and those kinds of things. So I won by the skin of my teeth. It was a swing district. And I did not know what I was getting into. I thought I did, but I was wrong. And that's kind of the genesis of this book because a lot of people decide to run for election. They maybe haven't served in other bodies. I had not really served as you know, a city council person or a school board member or anything. They really are in a culture shock kind of mode when they get elected. They think they're gonna change the world overnight and then they hit this institution, this marble fall of rules and traditions and protocols. And some of them become very frustrated and even discouraged. So I wanted to give them a guidebook and yeah. say, you yeah. can do this too. And we have to have like incredible perseverance to run for office. And so ugly, especially for women. I'm sure that first campaign, you got a little bit about that, but your campaign process is quite a while. How long is it? Because in, in Canada, we have like 30 days. So we literally have to scramble and put everything together <laughs> to put an office and, and get everything ready. We can do some preliminary stuff, but once the grit is dropped, you know, you have 30 days. How long is that process in Washington and... How do you, how do you get through it? Like, how do you find that stamina to keep going? <laughs> well, I think the state legislative level of campaigning is not the same kind of 
intensity as the national uh, campaigns, obviously for U US Senate, for president, for those kinds of campaigns. Those are almost endless kind of campaigns. At the state legislative level, the election, generally uh, you have about a 12 to 14 month process. So it's not quite as long, but it's sure not 30 days. <laughs> and <laughs> um, yeah, no, that would be quite wonderful, but no. Um, but a, a large part of it for, at least for uh, in my state with Democrats, um, in traditionally the large part of getting the pulse of the district and understanding where people are at, which is one of the jobs of a politician, is going just into neighborhoods and knocking on doors and talking people, talking to people one on one at their home, and it's a really informing process. But it eats your life. You start out at two o'clock in the afternoon, and you knock on doors, and you're not done until it gets dark, whatever time that is, because we're in the northern climb, so that's sometimes pretty early. But um, you have an opportunity to hear really authentic voices that way. You're not just getting consultants talking to you and pollsters talking to you. So it's a valuable learning experience. I learned more about my district by going door to door and talking to neighbors than I ever learned from polls or from consultants. Yeah, Paul, yeah. story because they're usually based on telephone landlines. And who, who uses a landline now, right? <laughs> so I take polls with a grain of salt. Yep. But it's so expensive to run a campaign in the United States. And how does one even get started with the fundraising? And has that actually changed from your first campaign until now? Right. When your first campaign is really hard because nobody knows who you are or whether they can trust you and whether they want to send you a donation or not. So that's a really hard thing to get started with. As I said, I had two groups of activists that were really supportive and both of them had access to some campaign funding and to hold events for their members that could provide some campaign funding. The first election was really hard. I was very lucky. Um, to be able to win by the skin of my teeth. But uh, once you win and you become an incumbent, really something very strange happens. Because all of a sudden, you start getting donations from organizations and businesses and that you never heard of before. You never had any relationship uh, before uh, with. And it's sort of out of thin air. And then you sort of start putting pieces together. When I was first in the legislature, I was appointed to the Financial Institutions Committee, okay? And after I was appointed to that committee, I started getting checks, campaign donations from banks and insurance huh. companies and payday lenders and all kinds of institutional donations that I had never had a relationship with before. It was bizarre. There was that bank robber way back when who said, when asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, that's where the money is. <laughs> He's right. That is where the money is. That's yeah. where the real money is, is in corporations and businesses. I haven't been the beneficiary of much of that, but I certainly learned my lesson in that first committee assignment that if you are in a position of influence, they will try to influence you. Yeah, yeah. And, and not um, naive. Yeah, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> so once you... And you also have to be able to take their money and not vote for what they want. Yeah. You have to have a spine to say no. And that's not easy for everybody. And I have to say, if you can't draw that bright line, you can't take those contributions. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Once you were in and you realized that, oh, this isn't what I expected, describe what that first week was like, your first week in um, legislature. Oh, it was like being in a, um, a fire hose having a fire hose just absolutely dump on you because there was so much information that I had no idea about. And there were so many rules and there were so many requirements. 
I remember my seatmate who was a very kind person and helped me kind of get acclimated. And she said, Karen, just remember when you're in the legislature, everybody treats you like you're a 10. And if you remember that old, old movie where the, the beautiful lady was a 10 in the judgment of men. <laughs> and it's true, people are obsequious and they try to suck up. And you just have to realize what they're up to and not take them seriously. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. What surprised you the most about it once you kind of weeded through those weeds? Uh, what surprised you the most about reality versus expectation? Right. I tell you, when you first get there, you're just in awe because you are in this incredible institution, big marble halls, the protocols, the high level of formality that exists in a parliament or in a legislature is very, very impressive and awesome and is meant to be. It's supposed to kind of curb your behavior so that you don't do odd, rude things. <laughs> I think that what's really interesting after you get over the initial impression of what you've got is how big a deal this is, how impressive it is in terms of the ability to make change and how in the world can you go about having an impact and learning and figuring out a path forward to have a real impact. And it's kind of a puzzle. There's no roadmap. There isn't any one way is the right way kind of path that you can take. So it's hard to figure out. And I might be a slow learner. I don't know. But I finally got it figured out, I think. And that's why I wrote the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and imagine in the beginning, trying to figure out who you can trust and who you can't trust. Because, I mean, if you find the wrong person to show you the ropes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. And though we do currently have a little bit of mentorship and some orientation training, there really isn't a formal way to learn how to do legislative work. There is not a school for that. And uh, even though you think you know what you're doing when you start, you learn along the way that you've got a hell of a lot to learn. You think they would teach you that in political science degrees, right? I tell you, you would think so. And that's what my degree is in, is in political science. But it's all very theoretical and philosophical. And it isn't the nuts and bolts and the grind of day-to-day of -day legislating. It is something you can learn. It's not rocket science, but it is technical. And you do need to be aware of pitfalls, real pitfalls. <laughs> That first season in House of Cards shows how hard a party whip has to work to secure bipartisan support for anything. And I imagine you have to be either, be either really great at people skills or have earned some immediate credibility, like you were saying. Um, talk about that process of securing bipartisan support to turn you know, any campaign promise into legislation. Is it, it's got to be, I mean, you're dealing with so many personalities like herding cats. <laughs> it is like herding cats. And you have to have to have, um, you have to listen. That's what you have to do most, most of all. You have to hear where other people are at in order to meet them or to build any kind of relationship with them. You can't just tell them what you think. You can't just tell them what you want. You have to hear what they think and what they want in order to figure out, well, how can we have a common goal here and meet in the middle or meet somewhere along that bridge to get across? It takes time to learn about people. This is not a quick transaction. It isn't a quid pro quo, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you this and you give me that. Um, and that has happened, I will say, but it usually happens among people who already know each other. But for people who are just beginning, it's really important to listen uh, where other people are coming from and to respect their perspective, even though you disagree with it, but to not ridicule them, to not cancel them, to not Ill ignore them. They are coming from somewhere you don't understand. I'll just tell you this funny story. One of the first things I ran into on a committee I don't know why I was on, but I was on natural resources. 
and we were talking about requiring life jackets for children on boats. And I thought, well, that makes total sense. We, would, we don't want our kids to drown if there's a boat accident. We have a lot of boating going on here. And the woman from a different part of the state who was extremely conservative said, that would be an interference with parental rights to have a state rule to require a life jacket on a child in a boat. And my jaw dropped. I was absolutely flummoxed at anybody who could have that kind of perspective. Okay, so um, this woman and I were on diametrically opposed teams, right? We did, by the way, finally get the bill passed to have life jackets for kids. Uh, but she turned out to be someone whose real part was in her family. And her family was the beginning and end of her real experience, to be honest. I mean, that's where she was coming from at all times. I'll never forget when my mother passed away. She, says, she sent me the kindest note. Mm. Yeah. So they're, they're people. They're just so different. And they have a different perspective. And you, you maybe aren't going to get their vote. But you don't disrespect them just because yeah. you, you don't agree with them. How do lobbyists fit in the picture? Because they're a huge part of American politics. They are. They're really the professional lobbyists or professional lawmakers uh, because lobbyists don't have term limits for one thing. They are there forever and they, uh, they know their way around. Many of them are former staff people. So they really get the ins and outs of the detail of it's legislative. It's a job too, it's a paid and job. That is the real, that's a real book of knowledge that you have to figure out. And so in states where they have term limits, the governor's office and the lobbyists really run that st state, not really the lawmakers because they're only there for six or yeah. eight years mm -hmm. and they're gone. So unless they have some kind of organized method of passing the torch so that things can get proceed, it's really a fits and starts kind of approach. Um, lobbyists are um, sometimes good, sometimes helpful, and sometimes not. For most <laughs> lobbyists who are on um, a payroll of a company or a business, it, their, their main job is generally to kill bills. They generally want to stop things from happening. For lobbyists, for nonprofits, for organizations with a mission, whether it's housing or health care or women's rights, they are a, a formal po professional lobbyist, but they're trying to pass things. They're trying to get things changed. And so it, there's two different camps in the lobbying world, and there are good and bad lobbyists in both of them. Politics is so hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't just give a person the term lobbyist and say, okay, they're a bad person because yeah, they're yeah. working out. Yeah. So you have, to, you have to figure things out. And there's a lot of nuance. And we're not in a world where nuance is really regarded. We just like to have labels, right? We like to have people in their little boxes. True. And uh, you can't get stuff done in a little box. you got to have a bigger, bigger play field. <laughs> And and there's so much, like you were mentioning when you first got in, there's just so much to know, particularly about legislation and bills. And, you know, these bills are massive in pages. How does one even begin to understand the process and procedure of the leg of particular legislation that you're working on? And how much work is involved with each bill? before it even comes to the floor for discussion. I know there's a great video out there of how the bill works, how a mass <laughs> bill works, which is really great. If I find it, I'll throw it in my YouTube yeah. link. But yeah. overall, when in reality, when you're working on it, I mean, it can take years, right? It does take years in big bills. On big issues, it does take years. On some things, it's their moment and, and they happen very quickly. But that's that's rare. Uh, for real serious change of direction and policy, it's not going to happen overnight. We worked on paid family and medical leave in our state for 15 years, mm -hmm. and we finally got it passed. And it was finally implemented right as the pandemic hit. Oh wow! Thank God, it was 
wonderful because it helped tens of thousands of families have some partial pay, pay replacement wage and job security when they had to either care for a family member or for themselves with this awful pandemic we all experienced. But it hit the program pretty hard because <laughs> we had prepared for a regular year, not for a pandemic <laughs> year. <Yeah. laughs> and when the first six weeks of uh, reporting of the, um, the fund came in, we were all in a bit of a panic because there was a huge demand and there were and people had been laid off and so people weren't paying the premiums so there was no revenue <laughs> but we did get it stabilized we got it healthy and it is now one of the most important and popular programs in the entire state what is the key to longevity in politics because you've been you've you've been a Run for a few terms, so that's right. So what what call, Smith, I'm what you call a veteran. <laughs> yeah, a veteran. So, but we're seeing that even like our prime minister has been around for a few times. Yeah. So, so what's the longevity of you know what's that key? Well, I think you have to love the work. Okay, if you don't love it, if you don't really get a thrill every time you get something changed that needed changing and it's worth your time and your effort, you can't stay with it. And if you aren't successful in getting things done, you won't stay with it. So that's, again, why I wrote the book, because so many young people and people don't have a background in the process of legislating, which is most everybody, get so frustrated and so upset and so discouraged by when their bill doesn't pass the very first year, they think they're a failure. And we need to understand we're in it for a long game and we have to have a strategy for a long game. That's why the analogy to baseball is so much more apt than, say, football or basketball. It isn't just, you know, the last quarter or the last two minutes. It's the long game. And um, anyway, that's the way I look at it. And, every, and just like baseball, you got to have hope. Every time there's, you know, new uh, season opening, you got to have hope. To, this is the year you're going to get it done. And a perfect <laughs> is still 30%. <laughs> <laughs> Politics and being in the limelight with all those warts and haters is, is, a big deal, especially if you're one of the representatives who's so recognized in the community. So how do you stay grounded with the love you get and all the hate you get that accompanies the job? <laughs> you have to be grounded in yourself. I mean, you can't depend on others to give you what you need to be secure and comfortable and optimistic. So you that is a um, personal meditative process, a spiritual process as well, really, for me. And I come back to ground zero to get there. And I am, because I'm a politician, I have to be gregarious and sociable and meet a lot of people. But when I'm not working, I am very quiet. I am very not meditative is maybe a little too serious of a word, but I, I withdraw and regroup and we restore my energies. There is a page <laughs> on our Canadian government website that discusses disinformation as a threat to democracy. How do you see it? I see it as very dangerous, extraordinarily dangerous. And I am so worried that a uh, large number of our population are so gullible and uh, able to be manipulated. I worry that we have not done a decent job of creating a skeptical population that doesn't believe everything they see on TikTok or on, what is it called, X, or any of the other social media platforms, or on any other media. There's so many different media now that people dabble in and use and become interested in. But there's a um, unfortunate ability to manipulate 
and to almost brainwash some people who listen only to one channel, only to mm -hmm. one voice, only to one world. And I think one of the best things about being in the legislature is you don't get that opportunity. You hear from all kinds of perspectives and you meet all kinds of people. And it's a constant influx of things you normally wouldn't have any understanding or knowledge of. And that's being a curious person by nature and being open to new ideas. Those are how I think you get to decent decisions. Once you are becoming a closed consumer to just one voice and one thought stream, I think that's when things go really seriously wrong. And I'm afraid way too many people have become closed and not open. Sadly, yes. And as somebody in politics, particularly women who get viscerated in the digital space as well as from their damn colleagues across the aisle, a lot of them will get discouraged, not stay. Well, even just the act of running for an election, it can discourage them. Some of them are the best people for the job and you really want them in those jobs. So how do we encourage more people to look beyond the besides buying your book <laughs> look beyond the dark side of this and just keep going because we need them yeah we do i um there is in our culture and probably in nearly every culture a pervasive um culture of sexual discrimination and harassment against women and it has affected many legislatures and legislative bodies as well. And there was a movement a few years ago called Me Too, hashtag Me Too, where um, women shared the stories they had experienced of sexual assault, sexual discrimination, and really horrible situations. And the sharing helped open the door to discussing the issue. Unfortunately, it doesn't stop. It doesn't end the actions. It's okay to talk about it, but it, you also need to have real guardrails and protocols and rules in place in our society and in the legislature in order to stop it. And that's not easy to do. People feel at first like, you're trying to be a school mom or something, you know, you're trying to correct them. We passed several bills on sexual harassment and um, we have, I think, addressed it openly, but it is not, it never goes away. Unfortunately, you have to continue to push and persist on these kinds of issues. They don't disappear, even though you are openly discussing them now and sharing them, they're still there. And Unfortunately, uh, it exists and you just have to manage it because and push back against it. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think we're seeing more feel empowered to push back a little harder now, too. Not everybody. So. There are still people that are pretty vulnerable, like immigrants. And there are people in very vulnerable positions who, who just don't have the resources to push back. But, you know, overall, publicly, I think you're right. It's uh, it's hard. It's so hard to pass legislation. And yet, you know, we must keep trying. <laughs> so who inspires you? Um. Well, originally, uh, El uh Eleanor Roosevelt and a woman named um, uh, Frances, oh, I'm having a brain freeze. She was the very first U.S. Department of Labor Secretary, and she was an absolute pioneer in terms of getting, uh, and this was during the Depression, getting uh, programs like unemployment insurance actually started. She was the person who started it. and people who think out of the box and have real strength of uh, persistence and um, 
just mission, if you would, a mission to do things differently. She had witnessed the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York City, where it was a garment manufacturer who had locked all the exits and there was a big fire. And all of these young teenage girls who were sewing shirtwaist dresses ended up jumping out of the windows and dying in the fall. And she watched dozens of young women jump out of windows and die in the fall. So she was so struck by that, that she went to the New York state legislature and got one of the very first laws passed for women workers safety. And then she went on from there and Franklin Delano Roosevelt picked her to be the very first woman cabinet member in the United States. So she was an absolute, when I read her, her biography, I was absolutely inspired. Uh, wow, what a thing to have that. And so she was one of my inspirations. And I have to say that even though people hate her, I think Hillary Clinton is in the same league. I think she is absolutely persistent and strong She's and, and, and amazing. Sadly, um, I am sorry to say, I think because she's a woman, she lost the presidential race. And that is what we have across to bear, in my opinion, as a country. So we will see yeah, where we go yeah. from there. But life would have been so much better and different had that not happened. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> what is a message of hope you can give to your constituents and the rest of us about the future? Well, I see bright skies and dark clouds, and I aim for the bright skies and try to navigate my way there to arrive where we think things will be better for most people. And by most people, I mean women and people of color and working families. Those are the kind of uh, uh, constituencies that I feel are the the real drivers of a culture and an economy and a country. And if we can address the needs of them and protect their futures and enhance their lives, that's going to turn out better for all of us. We all do better when we all do better, right? Right. <laughs> Senator Kaiser, thank you so much for coming on my show. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm glad we were able to pull this off and together, Debbie. It was a thrill. It was a thrill to be able to meet you and to talk with you. Thank you. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.